Hello, welcome to the video. This one's about Dr. Feelgood, who are probably the most important band to emerge from the London pub rock scene of the 1970s and 80s. This is a bit about my experiences with Dr. Feelgood in the early days, my time with Wilco Johnson, and I'll tell you what I think about the big controversy. Is Dr. Feelgood now just a covers band? But first, let's hear a bit of Dr. Feelgood. Right, I'm going to divide the rest of this video into three parts. The first part is going to be about the origins of Dr. Feelgood and how I first saw them and what they did. And then the second part is about my time with Wilco Johnson because I used to work with Wilco quite a lot. Then the third part is about the big controversy. I'll tell you what I think at the end. So stick with me. Dr. Feelgood started in 1971 when Lee Brillo, whose name was John Collinson, I think, got together with Wilco Johnson, who was born John Wilkinson, and Sparko, who was um, born Sparko. So anyway, they got together in 1971. They'd been in various bands in Canby Island together. They just basically went back to basics. They played very high energy R&B and blues from the American South and Chicago, and um, basically it was very stripped back. It was very raw, but the important thing was that there were no gimmicks, but Wilco Johnson and Lee Brillo in particular were two outstanding performers. Wilco Johnson taught himself to play lead after hearing Johnny Kidd and the Pirates, the guitarist Mick Green played a, a, a curious style which meant he played the guitar with both hands. There's lots of videos about how he plays that, so you can check them out elsewhere. Um, so he learned to play the guitar. He had this choppy style, which was the signature of the band. Lee was a very charismatic frontman. Frankly, one of the secrets of the band, Dr. Phil, was that they were pretty much on amphetamines. beans. And Wilco Johnson left because the rest of the band, especially Lee, thought he was um, too reliant on amphetamines. And I used to work with Wilco after this in the 1980s, and he did tell me on several occasions that um, he wasn't very surprised they did throw him out because he was very hard to work with. And he was very uh, difficult. Wilco st um, still is, actually. He frightens me too. Look at that face. Wilco Johnson is one of the most difficult people I've ever met in my life, and I've, and I've met quite a few. Dr. Feelgood used to play mainly in London. They obviously were very big in South End, their home area, Canary Island, the South End. But it was the London pub rock circuit that really made their name. They backed, early on, they backed Hines, who was a rock and roll performer of the Joe Meek School. Incidentally, this is nothing to do with it, but um, Screaming Lord Such told me that Hines murdered Joe Me and his landlady. So whether that's true or not, I don't know, but people have told me it's all balderdash. Well, not they haven't used that word, but they've told me it's all balderdash, but I think there might be a... I think David Such, Screaming Lord Such, thought there was a lot of truth in this. So I think there's a bit more to it than meets the eye. I think that at the least, Hines was there when it all happened. But anyway, perhaps I'll talk about that in a later video. This isn't about Hines, this isn't about Joe Meek, this is about Doc Feelgood and Wilco Johnson. They did lots of things, but predominantly they played over and over again every night they could on the London pub rock circuit, in particular a pub called the Kensington. That's how I saw the Dr. Feelgood first. I saw them several times there. I saw them at other places too, but I can't really remember, because in those days, 
There were so many great acts playing every night of the week. I mean, any night of the week, and there was no internet, you had to buy time out to find out who was playing when. It was free to start with, and then they start charging, and I went to work for them eventually, but time out was the place you found out about it, and you got your time out every week, and everybody bought it on a Tuesday when it came out. You went through the whole week's listings, and you marked off the dates you want to go to watch bands, and one of the bands I used to go and see quite a lot was Dr. Phil. And then they got very big. They had two albums out in 75, 76, I think it was. And then the big one that broke them was in 76, which was Stupidity, which not surprising was their live album, because Dr. Feel Good were always a great live band. That was a thing, the energy of their live performance, that album really captured it. I think everybody went to any pub rock gigs bought that album, plus lots of people around the world too. So that's what it was, and then, and then they were recording the next album at a studio, I think, thinking Wales, and Wilco told me that um, basically they tried to get him to do all these guitar tracks before they kicked him out, but he knew something that was up, and eventually I think they got him to do most of them, and then they, in a not very nice way, I believe, I can't remember the details, but Wilco was very hurt by it. And so there you go. So then he went off and he formed a band called Sonic Senders. Dr. Wilco used to play in pubs. Then they went off to play in bigger gigs and, and he really enjoyed that because Wilco enjoyed the big stages, etc. And when he was doing shows with me, they were definitely not big stages. In fact, we did several tours of Ireland together. I first met him to speak to really at when I was putting on gigs at the Cricketers. And a guy called... Andy McQueen, I think his name was, was an agent and he came to work for me because I ran an agency and he basically got Wilco Johnson to do live shows again. Because after Solid Senders, he had an, a hiatus and he stopped performing because I, I don't think he really got the same buzz out of playing on small stages with his new band as he did with Dr. Feelgood. So anyway, eventually he got his own band, which is a... I think to start with was a four piece and then became a three piece. And the lineup that I worked with for most of the 1980s was Wilco Johnson on lead guitar and vocals, Norman Watroy on backing vocals and bass, Norman from the Blockheads, and Salvatore Ramondo, who is a local drummer from South End, whose parents actually ran a ice cream company. He was the drummer. So that was the lineup that we toured Ireland with four or five times in the 1980s. It was the catalogue of errors from beginning to end from when we did our tours. The first tour was the worst of lot, actually. And, our, and we drove over in the band's van, which broke down very at, just outside Cork. And it cost an absolute fortune to get it mended. In fact, we were so broke. All the money we'd earned from all the gigs went into fixing the van and so it meant that we were staying in this hotel and we couldn't actually check out the hotel so we had to go and drive all over Ireland to do these shows because we couldn't afford to check out the hotel. So anyway, that was fun, so that added to it all but we had lots of interesting times. Wilco is not the easiest man to get on with it as I mentioned before. Over these tours we had ups and downs but generally we were very friendly. I was also putting him on at the same time at my various gigs. I was booking him out as his agent although he had a nasty habit of um, telling people that they should book him direct and not go through me. I sadly, I think it was 2004, Wilco's wife Irene, who I got on very well with, who did all the booking for him well fact, he did everything for him because when she basically got cancer and she, and she died in hospice and Irene was very was a very lovely woman and she basically kept Wilco on the straight and narrow for years so when she died there was a lovely funeral in a forest out in Essex somewhere there was like a they had a wicker coffin and it was a very quiet very private funeral and that was a very very sad time for everyone and then from then on actually Wilco and I drifted apart really I suppose you could say but when Irene died it turned out that Wilco didn't know where his money was he didn't know how to write a check he didn't know well he didn't know anything basically oh there's all sorts of stories about him leaving his dog tied up outside grocer's shops and things like that and he's just like Wilco was a bit of a state in those days and when Irene died he just got worse we eventually fell out 
because when he was um, diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and was had just weeks to live apparently a group of people who knew that I was quite close to him got me to well we discussed it and because we weren't sure what it was we thought obviously if he's got a, if he's dying of pancreatic cancer it, it, it's probably worse than he actually was because it turned out he wasn't dying of pancreatic cancer but w but we thought that he was and he was about on death's door so I wrote to him and said look I think you should think about this and maybe you should go out let people remember you as you were but as it turned out he took umbrage at that i am told i he hasn't spoken to me since he, um i put him on twice in margate um the first time the agent rang me up and said well actually jim it's very embarrassing because i know you're a pal of wilco's but um he's asked me to ask you not to speak to him at the show just only just go through the um, term manager. Accidentally, I was walking past the dressing room when he opened the door and I'm just standing there and we were facing each other and bearing in mind that I was told not to speak to him, um, I thought, well, I am paying him quite a lot of money. So I'm standing there facing him and the door opens and we're both quite, quite surprised, I think. And I said, hello, Wilco. And he says, hello, Jim, in his in April style, and then closed the door on my face. <laughs> so that was that. And then I put him on again afterwards, and I don't think I spoke to him. I, I, don't, I don't think I actually saw him. When I was doing him, well, up to the time he got cancer, really, I think the last time I did him properly was 2008, when we did two nights at the 100 Club at the end of my tenure there, last time being New Year's Eve on 2008. His success, he had a mild success then. It was, he didn't have to, we didn't know he had cancer then, but he had a mild success. He had much more success than when I, I was working with him because Julian Temple produced a film called Oil City Confidential about Dr. Feelgood. And he was the undoubted star of the show. And so there was a huge resurgence in Wilco G. Johnson mania. And so he became much more successful. And frankly, the minute he did become successful, he saw like moved away from me. He got a manager. That's the, that, that was me and Wilco, wish him all the luck, as I say, but our paths have diverged. This speaks about the controversy about whether the current line of Dr. Feelgood are a covers band or a genuine extension of Dr. Feelgood. Right, this is what I think. Um, when Dr. Feelgood started in 1971, nobody who was in the band then is in the band now, because um, Lee's died, Wilco was thrown out in 1976. Well, there you go, and the others are just left. The, the, the lineup now is a pretty good lineup. Um, it's not the same, obviously, as it was back then. Robert Kane, who's the lead singer now and the harmonica player, is not Lee Brillo. But in fact, he doesn't pretend to be. The thing I like about the current line, they don't try to imitate Lee. I mean, Robert doesn't imitate Lee. Kevin on drums is not the big figure. He doesn't try to be. And they just are a very good band. They play the same songs, obviously. They do new songs. In fact, their only hit that Dr. Feelgood had was after Wilco Johnson left, which was um, Milk and Alcohol. So I think it's like saying, are Manchester United not Manchester United now because they don't have Bobby Charlton or whoever else used to play with Manchester United. I don't even know who used to play with them. But football teams and bands evolve over time. Obviously, if you've got a band who are centred around one person, which Dr. Feelgood never was, frankly, he was always really Lee and Wilco were the two main characters in the early days. And obviously, the big figure was the big figure and Sparko was Sparko. And they were good and they were different and whatever. But there wasn't one person. It's not like you've got, say, Dex's Midnight Runners, which is centred around Kevin Rowland. I mean, without Kevin Rowland, you can't really have a Dex's Midnight Runners or a Dex's, in my view. When Lee died, he wanted the band to continue. The manager, Chris Fennick, has been the same manager since the early days. And that's it, so that's what they want to do. And I, and I put on Dr. Feelgood now, in fact, they're doing my next Margate Rhythm and Rock, hopefully, if that ever goes ahead after the pandemic's over. Let's hope so. But they're, a, they're not the same band. They're a different band, but they are the same band. So that's what I think, and I think good luck to them and they're very entertaining and there's loads of people who have never seen the original Dr. Feelgood who can watch the 
current lineup and have a very good time and they do believe so thank you for watching this if you enjoyed this video please like it down below please comment let me know what you think and subscribe you don't have to watch them all but you can if you want and thank you again for watching and goodbye